There was an eight-year-old in the audience the first time I saw this movie. And when I say audience, I mean myself and this family free that walked in right when the trailers were done. And like most people, I just assumed that they were in the wrong theater. And when they got a good glimpse of what was about to happen, they would just get up and leave. But for the first 10 minutes where we see an elephant's asshole open wide to shit diarrhea on people, when people are going, oh my god, what the fuck is that? Or fuck you, I hate you so fucking much. During God knows how many sex scenes where there are three people coming at each other from behind, a guy is snorting coke off of a woman's tits, and this younger woman, who doesn't even look like she's 18, lifts up her dress and pisses all over naked Brendan Fraser. They're totally okay with it. And it wasn't until the big dance number with Margot Robbie that the little girl decided, this is boring, let's get up and leave. Not the parents, but the fucking daughter, who, judging by her height, was clearly not even 10 years old. God knows eight-year-olds love to watch movies about silent cinema or movies where a naked dwarf bounces on a penis-shaped pogo stick that comes out champagne. So, Tyler, what is Babylon about? So Babylon takes place in the middle of the late 20s to early 30s, focusing on Three major people in Hollywood, a veteran silent film star named Jack Conrad, played by Brad Pitt, an up-and-coming actress named Nellie Leroy, played by Margot Robbie, and this film assistant named Manny, played by Diego Calva, as their lives are drastically changed by the shift from silent to talking pictures. Were you excited to see Babylon? I was at first. I mean, back in 2019 when this was announced to begin with, the thought of Damien Chazelle making a three-hour epic about the silent era with Brad Pitt, Emma Stone at the time, but like when she got swapped out with Margot Robbie, my enthusiasm didn't change. Even the sound of Tobey Maguire being in this got me really excited. I loved Whiplash. La La Land is one of my all-time favorites, and First Man, in my opinion, just doesn't get enough attention. I love that Damien Chazelle is able to make very dreary, realistic versions of what it means to pursue your dreams in show business still seem all the more whimsical and hopeful. Like, he does have characters who, as they become more successful and rise up the ranks, they start to lose a little bit of their humanity in a way that feels more genuine and raw compared to other movies of that category. But... When I saw the trailers, and it was nothing but the constant partying, the drug use, the implications of sex, and a lot of behind-the-scenes drama, without really getting into the specifics of the movie business, who were the actors, who were the crew members, what were their roles, it kind of had me concerned. And when I finally did see the movie for myself that one week before, there were aspects that made me smile and made me appreciate the love of filmmaking so much. But there were other times where I just felt cold, empty, or just nothing altogether. And I knew for a fact, like a lot of people, even if they give it five-star reviews, keep mentioning that it's a movie you have to see over and over again to get a concrete opinion. So I gave it some time. I listened to the soundtrack over and over again. And then I went back and saw it, hoping that things would get a lot better, hoping that all the minor details in the background that just disappear within an instant click again and give me more context and once in a while it did but to be honest the second time didn't make anything all that better and it's really hard to describe like i wouldn't necessarily call this a bad movie but it's not one that i got a lot of satisfaction of and especially when you compare it to movies about filmmaking like once upon a time in hollywood or even the Fablemans this year, it gets it doesn't have a lot of the components that I want from a movie like that. Well, as always, start off with what you liked about the movie. I wouldn't by any means call this some of his polished work. In fact, I do think that with the bigger budget that he's had compared to his last three movies, that he might have gotten a little bit over his head in making the style of the movie, the overall focus, compared to the actual substance. 
It's very rare when I could say that a style over substance movie did nothing for me, but Damien Chazelle directs one hell of a movie and makes the atmosphere the star of the show, leading to so many moments where very mundane activities or very simple activities are portrayed in this massive epic scope that only movies can make so fascinating to watch and can make you smile so wide. Just like La La Land, he has that technique where he breaks down so many jaw-dropping scenes with uh, very practical sets, terrific stunt work, and dance choreography in these long takes that are broken down into multiple setups, where the camera will stop at one point, and the camera movement simulates an edit very quickly, and there are a lot of components where actors are constantly moving around. There are objects flying in the air, like movie props that went off set or confetti in the dance sequences. Even live animals, they have elephants and snakes in stunts that could have went terribly wrong. But the way that these long takes are so elaborately and fluidly put together, you can tell that a lot of preparation had to go into it, that they rehearsed the hell out of it. But all of the actors involved make everything feel seamless, as if everything was being captured within the moment. In nearly every shot, there's something in the foreground and the background that is visually interesting to look at and actually plays a key component within the, within the story of each scene. Sometimes there are entire bits in the background that play for comedic effect, like near the beginning where there is an incredibly violent union dispute going on in the background where everybody is chasing someone until that someone has a horse and a gun. And in between that... In the foreground, there are actors and directors very oblivious to this who are just planning out a scene. And looking back and forth was just insane. Keep talking about the direction. Don't stop. Tell me how it portrays the magic of cinema, how it can impact audiences, what makes it so rewarding for the actors. It does a really good job at portraying the hard work and effort that goes into making a movie. And with the silent era especially, there were so many obstacles that had to be overcome in a short amount of time. I had no idea that you could, and in some cases had to film 10 or so movies on one backlot in the middle of nowhere, just because there was no time or money in order to film one movie at once and then move on to the next. The fact that there was an orchestra of musicians off camera performing their music so, their act so the actors knew how to react was something I had never seen before. And it was... It was absolutely amazing to watch, just showing how actors were directed in a silent era where they had to rely on their facial expressions and body language in order to communicate. And then once they shifted over to talkies, the cast and crew had to learn a brand new style of filmmaking that was a bigger risk than they had anticipated because it involved stylistic traits that the actors or even the crew members might not even be capable of accomplishing compared to what they used to do. It was an angle that I had never seen in a movie like this before. And probably the big way this movie shows how rewarding and worth the effort it goes to show, the impact that movies can have on audiences is whenever someone is watching a movie that they made, the movie is presented in black and white four by three, where there's hardly any sound, only one or two title cards, and it cuts back and forth between the movie's presentation and the audience members, how they're affected by it, how they're looking at other people's different reactions towards it. The finale of the movie uh, Manny is watching a movie and is brought to tears by the memories that it's bringing back to him. And then it pans all around the theater to show how audience members are reacting in various different ways. Some are glued to the camera. Some are so moved by it that their loved ones are embracing each other. And it brings this one camera movement that I forgot to mention in regards to the direction where... In order just to prove for a fact that these are long takes showing such elaborate stunt work, whether it's massive or mundane, it'll pull back to show the entire location and then zoom back in on the original character of Focus, sort of as this beginning and after effect. Well, since this is Damien Chazelle, how was the music? The best part about Babylon, without question, is Justin Hurwitz's musical score. I mean... I barely listen to musical scores, but I've been playing it endlessly the past week. I even put it on in the kitchen that I work with, that I work at, 
on loop because for a couple hours I was the only actual cook in the kitchen. Some others were in a meeting and it's the New Year's week at the country club I work at. We barely have anyone right now. And even when I played it on loop when people were in the kitchen, we were willing to listen to any kind of music so that there wasn't any awkward silence as we were prepping and cooking. But I mean, the tracks that... Hurwitz composes such as Champagne, Wild Child, and especially that big song that plays during the trailer, Voodoo Mama, that Margot Robbie does this electric dance to that is actually, the choreography to that is kind of symbolic, in my opinion, of the career path and life choices that Nellie, R Nellie Leroy, why is that such a hard name to come up with, ends up making. And the music, it has a booming orchestra the jazz tempo is just electric it is incredibly fast-paced justin Hurwitz is my pick to win best original score at the oscars because he has outdone himself since la la land and it is absolutely insane does it feel like an old hollywood movie as you're watching it other than the fact that everything is shot on location there are practical sets stunt work the fact that uh, once in a while you can actually see scratches within the film. It doesn't always feel like an old Hollywood film. There are a, a couple of modern techniques where in order to give certain scenes a sense of urgency and intensity because there are circumstances like an actress overdosing at a party or a stuntman that accidentally killed himself, the camera will keep whipping back and forth between actors deciding what they're going to do with this one person, how they're going to manage the situation from then on. And that technique does work. But one editing process that pissed me off so much was that whenever something crazy and fucked up happened, it would just cut away to the next scene like it was absolutely nothing. And I get the point that they were trying to make that people just move on from one tragedy and focus on the next, but it didn't come off that way. It felt like they just didn't know how to end a scene, and it was just too abrupt and jarring for me personally. You've talked solely about the craft of filmmaking thus far. What about the overall story? That's the unfortunate truth. The story is the most disappointing aspect of this movie. And I will say this, for a three-hour runtime, I can't say I was ever bored, but there were plenty of scenes, especially in the second half of the movie, where I felt absolutely nothing, even though it was clear as day, some really tragic shit is going on. But it didn't affect me, and I think the main reason for that is, despite it being three hours long and plenty of time to develop what's going on, despite the fact that on the poster, there are like six names as part of the ensemble cast. You only focus solely on three of them, that being Brad Pitt, Margot Robbie, and Diego Calva. And I'll talk about the other three who get severely underutilized, but bizarrely enough, even the three characters who are the main focus, despite it being three hours long, you really don't know that much about them. I mean, the actors do great work as always. And one thing that all three protagonists have in common is that they want to break into the movie business because they want to be part of something bigger. They want to entertain people and transport them into a fictional world where you feel like you're living and identifying with the characters being portrayed on screen, no matter how far away from reality, how far from your reality it is. And that's the beauty and magic that cinema can have, magic that is severely lacking these days. But there were so many questions about these individual characters that I kept asking myself, and I still don't really have that big of an answer to it. Like, what genres or what kind of roles are these actors and filmmakers so passionate about? What, act, what movies have affected them in the, in the past? What were their lives like individually before they became part of Hollywood? And what are the movies that they're working on within the film? What are they even really about? I got those questions from Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I got those questions from The Fablemans. You don't get that here. The closest you come to having a fully fleshed out character is Margot Robbie as Nellie Leroy. And as many people have pointed out, this is by far one of the best performances she's given. I was a little worried that the Harley Quinn accent that she carried over here would get old and tiresome but weirdly enough the movie actually does call out the jersey accent 
and it actually ties into the themes about how actors had to conform in order to maintain this public image that they're so suave and sophisticated when really they're a bunch of dirty profane disgusting pigs and there is a decent not that emotional scene where you do see the struggle that Nelly has to go through in order to make herself appear more sophisticated and bourgeoisie among these pretentious upper class citizens who will say mean shit behind her back regardless and call her a tramp anyways. You really do feel for the pain that she has to go through the very few times they offer glimpses to what her tragic backstory is like. There's one scene where she goes to visit her mother and without getting into specific spoilers, even though there's not really that much to spoil, it is it is just sad, awkwardly quiet. They barely have anything to say towards each other. And it's disappointing to watch. Several scenes later, you see her dipshit of a business partner slash father leering another woman and seeing the vengeful look in Nellie's eyes makes it abundantly clear that he has caused her so much pain in her life and she is desperately craving for attention she feels she's owed but she still clings on to people who really don't have her needs in their hearts out of this desperate and naive hope that somehow they may end up changing their ways even though it's clear repeatedly that they're not going to which i think that can sum up a lot of actors who yeah, there are plenty of actors that desperately want attention, and they feel as if the fame of an actor or actress will be enough for them, but it won't. And it's a good lesson, but it's a lesson we've seen a dozen times before, and while it's effective at moments within Babylon, it does, it's not enough to make her stand out as a character. But at least she has stuff to work with. I mean, with Brad Pitt, Jack Conrad is basically a much more sophisticated, handsome, and even more drunk version of Rick Dalton. But again, I really don't know what his filmography is like. He keeps saying that he's sick of costume dramas, but we don't know what other genres he would like to work with. He has this weird obsession with foreign languages and women who speak foreign that goes absolutely nowhere and is a cheap, unfunny gag. And... There's not really much I can say about the character. Brad Pitt does bring some empathy to this role, but I still felt absolutely nothing. But believe it or not, the worst out of the three protagonists is actually Manny, and it's not Diego Calva's fault. He gives a good performance and is actually as up to par as Pitt and Robbie, despite probably having less experience than them as actors, but... Out of all three protagonists, you know the least about him, other than, yeah, he crossed the Mexican border when he was a kid, and that's all we find out about him. I really wish I had more to say about the cast and crew within this, but with Manny especially, he's just the generic young, naive, innocent dreamer who becomes more successful and a little more selfish, and he has to decide whether his fame or his family is more important, which there's no stakes to the arc because the only person he forms a concrete relationship with is Margot Robbie, even though as a romance, I didn't buy the chemistry between Robbie or Calva. I don't know what it was that was supposed to make their relationship all that romantic. What did they have in common? Sure, they snoked... They snoked they snorted coke once and very vaguely talked about their dreams, but it's the, I want to be part of something bigger. What do you mean? Like, you have to elaborate on this shit. And weirdly enough, she makes him elaborate during this coke binge, and it's still incredibly vague. It's really sad when the side casts that get that gets so underutilized to the point where in certain scenes when they pop up again, I just sat there, even on second viewing, like, oh yeah, you're in the movie. Which is a really, which is a real shame, because while their arcs, again, you've seen a dozen times, it's portrayed in a more visual manner where you see the atrocities that are inflicted upon them or they inflict upon other people, and their physical reactions say everything about their personalities, what they're feeling in the moment, whether or not they're going to regret their career choices later on. It's a lot more effective. I have no idea how to say this one actor's name, but as the jazz musician who 
basically has the exact same arc as Lee Jun Lee as this one Cap Ray singer who, um, I gotta say, for a movie filled with depraved, unadulterated sex, she's the sexiest part of the movie, and she doesn't even flash a nipple like Margot Robbie does. She just acts in such a sensual fashion where her body language is incredibly seductive, her voice is so sultry. She was just such a pleasure to watch, and anyone who's seen the movie knows exactly what scenes I'm thinking of, but... It's an erotic drama with naked people and orgies. Like, I want something sexy to happen, which really, again, like, barely anything sexy happens. I know this is a minor sidetrack, but for all the nudity that happens within the movie, you really feel nothing but shock value because it's only on screen for like a couple seconds per nudity, per nude scene. And it's shot from such a far distance that you don't really, half the time, you can't even tell what's going on. I mean, when you see sex in a movie or TV show, do you want it to be far from a distance or do you want it to be up close where you can feel the passion, however hedonistic it may be, that the characters are going through? So, okay, minor tangent there. But with Lee Jun Lee and Yovan Adepo is my best way of pronouncing it. I really wish I had looked this up before recording. They basically have the same arc where they want to get their foot in the door, but, well, you could take a wild guess as to why that's tricky. With Lee Jun Lee's character, it's actually trickier because of some personal details that she flaunts around in a way that most people... It's weird. She has this ability to flaunt her personal life in a way where people don't take her seriously. But at the same time, that actually comes at a cost because without giving anything away, it actually makes her feel a lot more lonely in life because it involves something... God, how do I describe this? Well, you can't really describe it because that would be spoiling the whole thing. And with... And with the uh, jazz musician, the jazz musician Sidney Palmer, I remember the character more than the actor because that's just such a that's such an iconic sounding name. He has less of an arc, but there's more time focused on it. And one really tragic scene to watch where um, he has to apply makeup. Yeah. Well, that's. Uh... Quite a bit of progress you made without me having to interject, so what are your final thoughts on Babylon? Babylon is a movie that had so much potential, and in some cases does utilize it to its full advantage. I mean, it is a beautifully shot movie. The music is just so catchy, and you can listen to it at home on repeat forever and ever, and it wouldn't get bored. And there are some good performances from Margot Robbie, uh, Gene Smart, who I didn't talk about, has one great monologue that summarizes the rise and fall of Hollywood and how it tends to repeat itself for various different reasons. And out of all the side characters who are just in it to portray the atmosphere and cold environment of Hollywood, Olivia Hamilton, PJ Byrne from Legend of Korra, yeah, Bolin is in this movie, and you know what? If he talked that way in Legend of Korra, he'd be a funny character. And an unrecognizable Spike Jones are the most passionate filmmakers who are so willing to do just about anything to get a shot right, to get a movie finished, that they may or may not be willing to kill people. Led to probably a couple... It's, it's shocking how there were some actual deaths within the movie. There's so much that I could go on talking about, about in regards to what's great about the movie, but the things that they don't focus on, namely the characterization and having a concrete arc for each of them. For three hours, it's just not enough to sit through gorgeous imagery and insanely awesome music. Well, in either case, Tyler, I'm incredibly proud of you for managing to come up with such a thoughtful review off the cuff without even looking at your script. I know it was incredibly challenging, and I am sorry that you had to stumble in your words every now and then, but as long as you keep at it with this technique, I can hopefully guarantee that you will become a much stronger reviewer that way. And with that, that's all the time that we have left for this therapeutic review. If you've seen Babylon, let us know in the comments below what you thought of it. Be sure to stay tuned for more reviews, be sure to check us out on Patreon, and once again, thank you all very much for watching. Take care.